there's plenty of training out there on pulling green screens in post. Some of it great, some of it truly awful. But the vast majority of it only gets you through the basic process of using the keyer. Well, in this set of videos, we'll take you through the whole ugly truth of keying, and it is ugly, so that when you need to do green screen work in the real world, you'll know exactly what to do. As usual, we'll keep the training relatively platform agnostic. However, the green screen keyers on the market all behave so differently that you'll need to figure out the specifics for your keyer. Here, we'll be demonstrating the process with Blackmagic Fusion's Delta Keyer. We're also going to be working with nodes. Why? Because, quite frankly, it's the only way to keep your sanity while doing keying work. Time to get started. The first step you'll often want to do when pulling a key is to remove any video noise or film grain. The grain will often mess with the edges of your shot. Now you can always use the degrained version just for pulling the key while using the original grainy version for the final composite. Some nonlinear editors now include high quality degraining tools or you can purchase third party plugins to do the job. We'll kick off the keying process by adding Fusion's Delta Keyer to our green screen clip. The first step in most keys is to sample the screen color. This tells the keyer whether it's a blue, red, or green screen you're keying and will usually help it dial in a few other optimizations behind the scenes. Looking at the alpha channel, we can see that for this shot, the green screen has fairly uneven lighting, preventing a constant key. Unfortunately, this is a common occurrence, especially on larger psych shoots like this one. Keyers can often use a clean plate of the green screen to cancel out the unevenness of the shot. The Delta Keyer is such a keyer. A clean plate is a reference frame where the actors and props are removed and only the green screen is visible. Unfortunately, with a moving camera shot like this one, a clean plate is almost impossible to create without a motion control camera rig, so we're left without one. But the good news is Fusion includes an automatic clean plate creation tool. We'll add the clean plate tool and again select the background color. This time the tool removes everything except the green screen. What we want to do is grow the green border around our foreground subjects inward to simulate what the green screen would have looked like behind them had they not been in the shot. As we grow the edges inward, we can see that we've been left with some residual edge pixels from the foreground objects and so the green screen isn't accurately being repeated inward. So before we grow the edges, let's trim away a few pixels by eroding the edge. Now when we grow the edges, it's repeating pure green screen pixels without any trace of the original foreground. Finally, we'll fill the remaining sections. We now have our synthesized clean plate. And watch the dramatic difference as we add the clean plate to our Delta Keyer. You may notice the ground starts to look a mess and becomes heavily transparent. Don't worry, we'll fix that later. For a keyed map to work correctly, the transparent areas need to be pure black, a code value of 0, and the solid areas need to be pure white, a code value of 1. A contrast thresholding operation can be done to achieve this. However, if we zoom in on some edge detail, you'll see that adjusting contrast heavy-handedly will harden the edge detail. If we lose edge softness, the composite will look like the images are glued together like some crazy ransom note instead of seamlessly integrated. So this kind of thresholding should be seen as a last resort. But the problem of getting pure blacks and pure whites needs to be dealt with. Let's take a better look at the situation. By making a temporary gamma adjustment to the viewer, we can see that there are in fact non-white regions hiding throughout the foreground mat area. If we were using the mat as is, Regions like the boulder at center screen would appear transparent, showing the composited background through them. In the case of this shot, there are no issues with semi-transparent areas hiding in the blacks, 
thanks to the work of the clean plate operation we performed earlier. But in other shots, and let's remove the clean plate input to simulate that here, you'll also have to deal with non-black pixels that need to be brought down to black. A better way to adjust the contrast of a mat is to do so selectively in different bands of pixel intensity. This shot has a low exposure range. Looking at the brightest spot in our image, we can see that its green value is around 0.6. So we'll first adjust the crossover controls so that the effect of the three range sliders is spread more evenly between the variation in pixel intensity in our image. You'll now see that we can perform a more localized adjustment to the contrast in the image without damaging the soft edge of the mat as easily. Notice that even without the clean plate input, we've managed to get a reasonable contrast this way without significantly hardening the edge detail. Now at this point in the process, the focus should be to get the background to a solid black while preserving the soft edge detail. Don't worry too much about non-white pixels appearing in the foreground area. We'll deal with them in the next step. Making sure the background pixels are pure black should be your focus. Of course, we don't want to give ourselves more work than we need, so we've reconnected that clean plate tool to get a much cleaner background. On nearly every key you pull, you'll actually need to pull two keys, one for the nice soft edge and one to get the center or core of the mat a solid white. This is often called the edge mat core mat technique. Let's take a look at how it works. First up, let's stop and perform some crucial organization. Here in Fusion, we'll alt drag a connecting line to create an elbow a simple pass-through node that allows us to organize our input connections. One of the most critical things in node-based compositing is to keep things organized as you work. So we'll then select the nodes we've used to pull the key and add an underlay from the tool picker menu. We can then rename the underlay group to edge mat since this key is about to become the edge mat of our edge mat core mat pair. Rather than starting the key from scratch, we'll copy and paste the entire group of nodes and rename the second one to Core Mat. Switching to the mat controls of our Core Mat's Delta Keyer, we'll clip the whites of our mat using the threshold control. Adjusting the viewer gamma down, we can confirm that the whites are now completely solid throughout. In fact, We'll back off the threshold so that we're only clipping the whites as far as necessary to get the solid whites and no farther. We'll push the viewer gamma to the right and then adjust the low threshold to clip out any non-black pixels around the outside edge of our foreground subject. This gives us a solid black and white mat with really nasty hard edges. Well, to be fair, we still have the viewer gamma up but even so, the edges are much harder than we want them to be for a convincing composite. But now we have two keys, the edge mat key, which has the nice graduated edges, but some non-white pixels where we should have a solid foreground, and the core mat that has solid blacks and whites, but a nasty edge. How do we combine them? Well, if we use an erode operation, we can shrink the core mat so that it tucks neatly inside the edge mat filling in any holes in the mat without overriding the nice soft edge. Let's set the viewer gamma back to its default so we can see the edge accurately. In the case of the Delta Keyer, it actually has a solid mat input, so we can just connect the output of the core mat keyer into the solid mat input of the edge keyer. You'll sometimes add a blur directly after the erode operation just to make sure the transition between the two mats is smooth. Okay, now we come to the reason why pulling green screens with nodes is so much easier than a layer list style compositor. Take a look at the ground. It's a mess. The keyer settings that work for the rest of the shot fell miserably on the sandy ground that acts as a reflector for all the green bounce light in the scene. 
In a timeline compositing system, combining multiple keyers is a hassle, so people end up trying to do everything in one keyer, which is often impossible. But thanks to nodes, the problem becomes much easier to solve. We'll start by adding yet another delta keyer specifically for the ground key. We'll choose a green screen color that works best for the ground, and then adjusting the viewer gamut to better see what's going on, we'll adjust the low threshold to remove background noise. Setting the viewer gamma back to default, we can see that while the edge looks good, the center has holes in the mat. So as before, we'll duplicate the keyer and turn this second keyer into our core mat by pulling the high threshold down. We'll add the erode node and shrink the core mat then feed it into the solid mat input of the edge mat keyer. Zooming into the edge of the mat, we can clearly see where the core mat finishes and the edge mat starts. So we'll add that blur to the core mat to smooth the transition. Time to keep things organized again, so we'll add an underlay for this ground key group. Now we need to combine the previous key and this new key for the ground. If we simply merge them, the ground key will just add its hard edges to the original key, ruining the shot. We need a way to choose the original key for the top portion of the shot and the ground key here just for, well, the ground. We perform this little piece of magic using an ISO mat, short for isolation mat. It's a simple mat that isolates a portion of the image. In Fusion, we use the Polygon tool to create the ISO mat. We'll drag out a soft transition edge at the top of the shape. Now we can feed this into the mask input of the merge, and the mat isolates that section of the ground key that we want to use. Now if you find the exact opposite happens, just flip the inputs to the merge. In the case of Fusion, Control or Command T will do that trick. And yet again, will clean up after ourselves. If you look at the mat, you'll see we still have a hole in the foreground area and an unwanted section of wall at screen right where the green screen ended on the set. Sometimes you just won't be able to key out everything. So it's time to add some digital duct tape. We'll draw another shape that fully encompasses the hole and merge it over the current mat. This is typically called a holdout mat. For the section of wall at screen right beyond the edge of the green screen, we'll create yet another mat called a garbage mat. With the garbage mat, we'll invert the mat so that the portion of the screen we want to keep is white, and then we'll use a multiply operation, found in the channel booleans node in Fusion, to keep everything except the problem sliver of wall at screen right. Now a quick note about these holdout and garbage mat shapes. They need to be animated. Right now, they'll only work for the frame we're currently on, so we'll need to keyframe or track their position through the rest of the shot. But for the sake of brevity, we'll skip that step here, but you've been warned. Taking a look at the comp so far, you should hopefully see how our organization is saving the day. Along with an additional judicious splash of color, the groups of nodes make what might have been a confusing rat's nest reasonably easy to break down and understand. One of the disadvantages of building a mat out of multiple keyers is that you'll often create unwanted artifacts in the color channels as you go. In fact, as you're about to see, this isn't really a problem at all, since it allows us to treat the color channels as an independent process to keying. What we'll do is take a copy of the original green screen image and simply add the mat we've created to its alpha channel. 
In Fusion, you do this using a matte control node. which we'll set to Combine Alpha Mode. We'll also enable the Multiply checkbox to create a pre-multiplied image. Zooming into the edge, we can see a significant spill problem, along with a slightly overextended edge. Let's tackle the spill first. Now, there are many ways to deal with spill, but probably the most reliable and flexible is to use a Curves tool. Here, we'll add Fusion's Hue Curves tool. Notice that we can add it to the copy of the original green screen we're feeding into the matte control without worrying about affecting the version of the green screen feeding into the keyer. That's because we have a completely separate copy of the green screen being used for all the keying work. We'll select the green suppression curve and then sample the edge pixels with spill on them. Fusion places a keyframe on the curve in that region of spill. A hue-based suppression curve allows us to suppress spill in very specific areas of the color spectrum, reducing discoloration in areas not suffering from spill. We'll adjust neighboring keyframes to give a more gentle fall-off to the suppression. This avoids potential banding in the image. You can see how significant the change is when we toggle the hue curves node on and off. Now, in some cases, spill suppression can produce a noticeable reduction in the brightness of the image. In those cases, you can counteract the effect by slightly raising the luminance curve in the same region. Not really necessary in this shot, but something to be mindful of. You don't want to go too far without viewing a key in the context of the final background. Here we have a star field, which we can add with a simple merge, since we've already pre-multiplied the green screen with the key inside the matte control node. With our background added, we can see that we still have an unwanted haloing around the screen right edge of our actor. This can be caused by a number of factors, including sharpening filters applied during debayering, or simply the contrast ratio of color channels used when performing the key. So we need to shrink the matte edge to fit the shot. Fusion's Delta Keyer has a built-in erode slider. The problem with shrinking the mat here is that it's applied to everything in the shot. So the boulder to screen left of the actor, for example, is being shaved as well, even though it doesn't need it. So instead, we'll add an additional erode node directly after the keyer. We'll shrink the edge enough to remove the haloing, but this time, we'll add another ISO mat to the mask input of the erode node in order to isolate the erosion to just the screen right edge of the actor. Now it's important as usual to add a soft transition edge on the ISO mat. Toggling the bypass on the erode node, we can see that we've nicely tamed the problem edge without damaging any of our other key edges. The next problem we need to tackle is motion blur, or lack of it. The keying process, especially on unevenly lit green screens, will usually clamp a lot of motion blur, making the resulting key look blocky instead of fluid. Comparing the hand in the original green screen footage at left to the final composite, you can see how the motion blur has been compromised. Well, modern compositors have a secret weapon, optical flow. Adding an optical flow node Fusion calculates motion vectors for the frame-to-frame -frame movement of the pixels in the shot. We can temporarily visualize them in the viewer. Horizontal movement is indicated by red intensity, vertical movement by green intensity. Now, viewing them separately, you'll notice black areas. This doesn't mean that part of the image isn't moving. Rather, it means that it's moving in the opposite direction. For example, left instead of right. The opposite movement is represented by negative float values in the vector channels, and these negative values will always clip to black in the viewer. All right, we'll take this vector data and feed it into the vector input of a vector motion blur node, which will generate a variable blur based on the intensity of the vector data. Increasing the scale will exaggerate the effect so that it's clearly visible. But look at the metal studs on the side of the astronaut's suit. They've been motion blurred as well, even though they already exhibit the in-camera motion blur. 
so we want to avoid adding additional motion blur to anything other than the hand that the keying process has affected. The solution? You guessed it, another isomat. fed into the mask input of the vector motion blur node. When we're done, we have a pleasing motion blur for the hand, but the rest of the shot remains untouched. As a reminder, all of these custom isomats need to be tracked into position across the entire range of the shot. So here, we'll move to a later frame, reposition the iso shape, and then check the intermediate frames to make sure Fusion is correctly interpolating the position of the shape throughout. And once again, we need to stop and clean up our work. We'll add a group for the spill suppression and matte combine, and another for the motion blur fix. A useful and often horribly overdone effect is light wrap or background wrap. The idea is to add a simulated spill light from the composited background to the edge of our keyed element. The concept is to simulate the backlighting that would have illuminated our green screen subjects had they really been filmed in front of the new background. We we'll use a sufficiently gaudy sunrise background image here as an extreme example. Now, you can use a light wrap plugin for the job, but you'll get a lot more flexibility with the technique if you build your own. Let's see how it's done. To start, we need to take our existing keyed mat and build an edge mat out of it. We can use a special blend mode for this called XOR, short for Exclusive OR. In Fusion, we use the channel booleans node, take a copy of the existing mat as one input, and then add a slightly blurred version of the same mat as a second input. The XOR blend mode creates a mat wherever the pixels are neither the same nor the opposites of the two input images. The effect of this is a nice edge mat whose fall off can be adjusted by the blur strength. And don't worry if you don't understand what the XOR is doing, just enjoy the gag it produces. In the case of the light wrap, we only want to add light to the inside edge of the composite, so to restrict the edge mat to the inside, we can use another channel booleans node to multiply our edge mat against the original mat. This cuts away all of the outside edge, leaving us with exactly the mat we're after. And we'll pause for a moment and tidy things up. To simulate the lighting source from the background image, we simply apply an extreme blur. This removes any localized detail, but preserves the general shading color and intensity. We take this and add the edge map we just created to the alpha channel, pre-multiplying it against the alpha. To complete the effect, we'll merge it back over the current final comp using a lighten blend mode and then adjust the blend strength to keep things subtle. Now there are other light wrap techniques like using the spill suppression as a spill mat, but this simple edge mat can serve you well when applied sparingly. And of course, we add an underlay to organize things. All right, now occasionally, no matter what you do, you end up with a harsh edge between foreground and background that stands out, ruining the illusion of the composite. Now as a last resort, you can take the edge mat we created with the XOR, the one before we trimmed it to only include the inside edge, and use it to apply a selective blur just to the edges of the comp. We'll apply a blur to the entire image, and then use this edge mat as a mask to limit where the blur is applied. This effectively smears the edge pixels together, hopefully creating a more natural blend. Now, this is completely unnecessary for this shot, but we're demonstrating the technique so that you'll have another tool in your box of tricks. 
If you were to use this effect, you'd probably want to actually create a unique XOR edge matte since the one being used for the light wrap has a wider fall off than an edge blurring really warrants. When color correcting the foreground to match the background, you can pretty much add the color correction anywhere from the source green screen node right up to the final merge with the background. Just be sure to enable unpremultiplication and repremultiplication if you place the color correction after you've premultiplied the green against the keyed mat, as is the case here. The final step in any composite is to match the video sensor noise, or film grain if you're working with film, between all the elements. Whether it's grain or noise, it's the same basic workflow, so we'll just call it grain from here on in. We're kind of old school like that. If both elements have grain, you'll typically add grain to the least noisy element. In the case of this shot, the background is a grainless CG still. So we need to add moving grain to it in order to match the grain in the green screen element. The first step is to generate a synthetic grain that matches the source. In our case, the source is the green screen footage. We'll start by focusing on an untextured portion of the image. That way we won't be confused by any fine detail that's actually part of the scene and not grain artifact. The area is a little dark so we'll temporarily adjust the viewer gamma and gain to help us make out the grain more clearly. We'll add a blur to the source footage, blurring just enough to average out the grain, effectively removing it. Now this is obviously no way to degrain footage you'd actually want to use in a comp, but it will serve our purposes as we build our own synthetic variety. Apply a grain generator to the blurred footage. Here in Fusion, that's simply called the grain node will dial back the power to a more decent value. Now different applications will have very different controls for the grain match node, but the basic approach in actually matching the grain is the same. We load the blurred and regrained image in one viewer buffer, and then load the original image in a second buffer. We'll activate this viewer buffer's gamma and gain to make sure it matches the other. Then we use the split screen compare mode to create a side by side evaluation of the original grain, here on the right, and our fake grain. We can now adjust the strength, softness, and size. Some grain simulators allow you to also adjust black points, which is great for noisy blue channels. Once you've got a general match, switch the viewer buffers to the red channel. and dial in the look specifically for red, then green, and then blue. When you're finished, switch back to the full color and confirm that your synthesized grain is a decent match. With the match completed, we can now delete that blur node. It was just there to remove the original grain. Then we can rename our grain node and use Control or Command X to cut it into the paste buffer and paste it directly after our background. A last step for images like this that lack an alpha channel is to deselect the alpha multiply option. And that's it. We now have moving grain applied to the background, matching the grain in the foreground green screen image. Looking back over the entire composite, you'll see that we've actually done quite a bit of work. But because of the underlay groups we created on the way through, it's very easy to later adjust and maintain the composition. If we need to make changes to, say, the edge mat, we can go directly to the two nodes in that group without having to decipher what's going on with all the other nodes in the composite. With that, we wrap. 
but you should now have a solid grasp of not only the core concepts of keying a green screen, but also how to use modular node-based compositing to troubleshoot just about any keying shot that comes your way.